This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Most people in the world live in some kind of house or dwelling. Those houses come in all shapes and sizes, with different floor plans and layouts, and furnished in many different ways. And yet each home is precious and unique to its owner. But have you ever wondered whether or not God owns a house? And if he does, how could we recognize that house if we were to go in search of it today? Let's listen to John Moore as he leads us in searching for truth about the house of God. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul wrote to a young evangelist by the name of Timothy and said the following, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. From this passage, we learn that God indeed has a house. He has a dwelling place. And that house is also known as the church. And as we learned in a previous session, the church is the saved of Christ. And the church is also identified in Scripture as the kingdom, the body, the temple of God, and as we have just seen, the house of God. Now this building is not the church. It's simply a place where the church comes to worship and to study. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, that church though, the people, are very important. They're God's temple. And as God's temple, whether it's here or any other place in the world, is very unique. That temple, that house, has a unique architect and a unique builder. It had, and still does today, a very unique organization and purpose. It has some very important and distinguishable characteristics and traits. So let's go in search of that house. Let's discover for ourselves those traits and characteristics. And as we do, let's ask three very important questions. Who built the house of God? Number two, what are its unique characteristics? And then number three, let's ask, can we establish the house of God today? Let's begin then by answering that first question. Who built the house of God? Now the answer to that question shouldn't take us very long to figure out. In fact, I'm sure you already know. But let's listen again to the words of Jesus to discover for ourselves what God would have us to know about His church, His house. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In the last portion of this passage, we can clearly see then that Jesus is the builder of his church. And we might also notice in the statement that Jesus makes, I will build my church, that that possessive pronoun clearly points to Jesus. He is therefore both the builder and the owner of his church. But now listen to the Hebrews writer as he tells us more about the house of God and who is in charge of that house. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, 
for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. In considering this passage and lessons learned earlier about the church, we can conclude that, number one, Christ, as the Son of God, has built a house. Number two, Christians, the saved, are the house. And number three, Jesus is over his house. So yes, it is true. Christ is the builder and thereby the owner of his house, the church. And he is over his church. But what, in Hebrews chapter 3, does the phrase over the house have reference to? It is showing the uh, superiority of the church age over the old Mosaic age. Back at that time, Moses as a servant, now that's a key thing, Moses as a servant was ahead of that house. But Jesus, he is the Christ, he is the Son of God, he is the heir, and he is then ruler over the house, the church. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Do you notice that this passage tells us that Jesus has this authority? Nobody else. There is no man, no body of men, no council has this authority. That's plain and simple. Indeed, Christ is over his house. But how much authority does he have over that house? Let's listen to the words of Jesus. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So how much authority does Jesus have? That's right, he has all of it. That doesn't leave room for anyone else. All means all. And so if I want to know something about the house of God, then I must go to Jesus because he is the builder and owner of his church. Now, friend, let me ask you a question. Since Jesus is the builder, the owner, and the head of his house, do you or I have the right to make modifications and or additions to that house? Can we just take it upon ourselves to make changes or remodel the house that Jesus has already built? Let's say that you wanted to build a house in which to live. And let's also say that you possessed enough money to acquire land for the building of that house and materials to build it with your own hands. Then let's say you hired workers to aid you in constructing your house and then commissioned them to build it according to your specifications with exactly the amount of rooms requested with precisely the amount of floor space required. Then let's say that after the house was completed, you invited some friends over or maybe some relatives to stay in your house. Would those friends of yours have the right to modify your home according to their liking? Could they begin to make changes in your house without your authorization? Let's say that one day you discovered that one of your friends had done that very thing and had taken it upon him or herself to just begin remodeling your house by adding a wall here or a door there. How would you feel about it? Would it be acceptable? Absolutely not. Why not? Because that house belongs to you. You built that house with your own hands. You gave the money for it to be built. And so you therefore have the exclusive right to determine the design and the layout of that house and also how it will be maintained. In a similar way, Christ, as the builder of his house, he purchased the church, that is, he purchased the people with his own blood. He then commissioned the apostles to lay the foundation of the house and then to construct thereupon according to some very specific divine requirements as revealed by the Holy Spirit. As residents of that house, living in a house built and owned by Jesus, do we have the right to change or modify that house according to our likings? Do we have the right, according to our own opinions, to modify 
or restructure the organization of that house or put a different name upon that house? Absolutely not. As residents, we must leave the house exactly as we have found it. We must live in that house according to the divine principles revealed in the Word of God. So in answering our first major question about who built the house of God, we can clearly see that Jesus built the house of God. And as its builder, he is its owner and therefore has all authority over that house. But now let's ask our second major question about God's house. Let's ask, what are its unique characteristics? In other words, as we examine the Bible, what will we discover about the design and construction of that house? How is it organized? How does its members worship? What doctrine is taught in God's house? And what name or names are used in identifying God's house? You know, every religious group or religious house has unique characteristics that identify it or distinguish it from other religious groups. Just like your house can be identified from other houses by its unique characteristics, so the Lord's house can be distinguished from other would-be houses by its unique characteristics. So as we go in search of the Lord's house, let's find out what it looks like. And as we do, let's ask ourselves, does the house that we live in, the religious house, does it look like the house of God as revealed in the New Testament? So let's consider some of those characteristics. First, just like a house that you or I might live in today has a foundation, so the Lord's house has a foundation as well. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the house of God then should be founded upon Jesus Christ. It must not be based upon the notoriety of men or upon some human doctrine or human creed or an academic institution, nor should it be founded upon what may or may not be culturally acceptable or politically correct. Instead, the church of Jesus Christ must be founded upon Jesus himself, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So friend, I ask you, does the church where you attend claim to be founded upon Jesus? Second, let's notice another characteristic of the Lord's house. As we learned earlier, the Lord's house has a builder. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Who then is the builder of your church? Do you belong to the church built and established by Jesus? Another identifying characteristic of the Lord's house is its name. Many times in Scripture, it was referred to as the church of God, as in Acts 20 and in verse 28, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, Galatians 1 13, and 1 Timothy 3 and verse 5. But because Christ is God, it was also referred to as the church of Christ, as in Romans 16 and verse 16, where Paul said, the churches of Christ salute you. In naming the church after Christ, we bring glory to the very one who bought the church. For example, in Acts 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul said that Christ, as God, purchased the church with his own blood. Consider, for example, if you were buying a piece of real estate and you purchased that land with your own money, whose name should be on the deed? Suppose that you were providing all the funds necessary for the purchase of that property. Whose name would you want on the title of ownership or deed? Why yours, of course. You bought it and you own it, and therefore your name ought to be on the deed. In the very same way, because Christ purchased the church, don't you believe that his name should be on the title of ownership? Indeed it should. It belongs to Christ, and it therefore ought to bear his name and not the name of some other man. Consider also that in the New Testament, the church is often alluded to as the bride of Christ. Now what husband, including Christ as a bridegroom, would want his bride to wear the name of some other man? Indeed, shouldn't the church of Christ wear the name of Christ? 
in New Testament times, that's exactly what they did. The church wore the name of Christ. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So friend, does the house where you attend wear the name of Christ? Another characteristic of both a house and a church is its organization. Consider, for example, the Lord's house, that it has an organization. In Colossians 1.18, we read that Christ is the head over the church, that is, the church universal. But the Bible also tells us about the word church being used in a local sense, like the church at Philippi, or the church at Ephesus, or the church at Corinth. Now, when these churches were established, it wasn't long before godly men were appointed as elders to be the leadership and indeed to be those who shepherd and guide each of those local bodies or congregations of God's people. When we talk about scriptural organization of the Church of Christ, first of all, we need to understand that Churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16, are local congregations. But those members of the local congregations are members of the body of Christ, universal, over which He is the head and He is the supreme authority. But he has also given direction for the organization of each local church, that there be men who oversee that work called elders. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The term elder refers to a man who, along with other elders in any given congregation, were responsible for shepherding a single congregational flock. Now, these men were referred to in the Greek New Testament by three different Greek words. Each of these words are used interchangeably and can be found in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, and in Acts 20, in verse 17, along with verse 28. Notice the first term, presbyteros, which is translated by the word elder or presbyter. The second term, episkopos, which is often translated by the word bishop or overseer. And then there is the Greek word poimen, which is translated by the word pastor or shepherd. All of these terms refer to the same individuals who had met the qualifications as outlined in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus 1, verses 7 through 9. In those passages, we read that an elder had to meet certain qualifications. A bishop, then, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Now, not only did these men have to meet certain qualifications, but we also learn by reading in the New Testament that these bishops or elders were only charged with the responsibility of shepherding the flock of which they were a part. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Thus, friend, there is absolutely no evidence nor authorization in the Bible for a group of elders or a single bishop to exercise authority outside of the local congregation. The church at Philippi, for example, did not have elders that would oversee the affairs at the church at Ephesus or vice versa. There was no hierarchical structure in the early church other than Christ at the head of the church and the apostles that laid the foundation. But instead, in the New Testament, congregations were organized under the basis of an eldership, with each eldership overseeing the work that was among them, overseeing their own flock and who are responsible for guarding that flock and feeding that flock with the Word of God. Well, for a Church of Christ to be scripturally organized, it needs to go by the pattern of the Holy Scriptures. And in the New Testament, we see churches with a plurality of elders, Acts 14, 23, over one local flock, tending the flock that is among them, 1 Peter 5 and verses 2 and following, and there's wisdom in God's plan because He made sure that with a plurality of elders that if one man became morally or doctrinally contaminated that that wouldn't necessarily contaminate 
the whole leadership. There's a system of checks and balances that God built into this. There were deacons in the New Testament, but not a board of deacons per se. The deacons of the New Testament served under men who were elders, men who were elders, and they had to meet certain qualifications according to 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 8. And deacons also have to meet those qualifications, verses 8 to 13. Uh, preachers were never overseers of the church in the first century in God's pattern. Preachers serve under the oversight of elders. They're important, but they're not the leaders of the church in the sense that they make the final decisions. So basically, Philippians 1 talks about the bishops and the deacons and the elders. Of course, our bishops, that's an interchangeable word. So you have elders serving over a local flock with deacons serving under their authority and preachers doing the same thing and members also following the oversight of the elders who rule over them. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. So that's God's plan, and it's one we need to follow. So you see, God's house has a foundation, a builder, a name, and as we have just learned, a unique organization. So is the religious house that you are a part of organized according to the Lord's specifications? But now let's take a look at another characteristic of the Lord's house. One of those characteristics has to do with its unique form of worship. In God's house, Jesus directs that we worship God in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Did you hear what Jesus said there? He said that we must worship God in truth. And as we learned in earlier lessons, truth is the same thing as the Word of God. So to worship God in truth we must worship God according to the words of God. Now the words of God, the Bible, teach us that we can also worship in vain. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Thus we see that not just any type of worship is accepted by God, but rather as we read in the New Testament, we find that we must worship Him in spirit and in truth and that our worship must be authorized by God. Well, what then are the elements of acceptable worship? Let's first of all notice that when Christians in the first century came together, and as God's house when we come together today, that we must pray. Christians are to pray. They pray through and in the name of Jesus as the only true mediator between God and man. Prayer was and is a very important part of the worship of the church. In God's house, not only do Christians gather together to worship, but let's notice also that they gather together to proclaim the Word of God. When God's house gathers together, the Word of God is preached. This preaching is designed for instruction and edification. It is designed to nurture and strengthen the residents of God's glorious kingdom, as well as to convert the lost to Jesus. The teaching of God's Word is an essential ingredient in the life and work of the church. It is the source of food that Christians need to maintain their spiritual strength. In addition to proclaiming the Word, let's notice that in the Lord's house, Christians also contributed each week to a common treasury. After God's house was established in the first century, there became an immediate need to finance the work of the church. There were widows who were in need of money. There were preachers who were in need of support. And there were families who were destitute. And so individual Christians reached out to help those who were poor, those who needed help. And as they did so, they would often bring their money together in a common treasury that was collected each first day of the week. Now under the Old Testament, Jews were required to give a tenth of what they had earned or produced. In other words, they were tithed. Now, under the new covenant, in God's new house, no such requirement has been imposed. But instead, according to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 2, Christians are to give as they have been prospered. It is a free will offering, an offering that must be given with a cheerful heart. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. But now, in addition to giving each first day of the week, let's notice that in God's house that the Lord's Supper is celebrated each first day of the week. The first day of the week is a very important day in the life of the church because it is on this day that our Lord was resurrected from the grave. It was upon this day, Sunday, that the church was established. And according to Acts 20 and verse 7, it is upon the first day of the week that Christians meet together, that the church gathers for the purpose of worshiping God, and a part of that includes partaking of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a special memorial meal which calls to remembrance the body and the blood of Jesus. Not only does the meal remind Christians of what Christ has done for them, but it also serves as a testimony to the non-Christian about the love of Christ for sinners. And just like singing, giving, preaching, and praying do not become commonplace even though they are done every week, the Lord's Supper does not lose its significance though celebrated each week as well. In the first century, the Lord's Supper was a central part of the worship of the church. And its weekly observance continues to be an identifying mark of the Lord's house today. But finally, when God's house assembles together for worship, we find that they both praise God and edify one another through singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Yes, music is a very important part of the worship of the church. And yet the music of the New Testament church is uniquely different from that which is often encountered in many denominations today. The music of the Lord's house is a cappella. That is to say, it is singing without the use or the accompaniment of a mechanical instrument. This instrumental music was not introduced until the 7th century AD. There is no indication by the church fathers in the first three or four centuries of the church that it was ever even mentioned to be uh, introduced into Christian worship. There may have been a few individuals that might be talking about it, but it was never accepted as church practice in the first four or five centuries of the church. The 900s, it's finally brought in as a regular part of Christian worship. And it so divided the Christian world at that time that the Eastern Orthodox Church never could accept it and does not accept it today. When the use of mechanical instruments did gradually begin to be introduced into the worship services of various denominations, there were nevertheless some very prominent denominational preachers who were opposed to its use. When the Protestant Reformation did come along in the 1500s, even amongst some of the greatest reformers, the John Calvins, the John Wesleys, the Martin Luthers, they were all also very aggressive against the use of instrumental music in worship. Music as a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music, and here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. I have no objections to instruments of music in our chapels, providing they are neither heard nor seen. While it is noteworthy to observe that various Bible scholars of the past deplored the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship, it is of greater significance to know that the New Testament nowhere authorizes its use today. When it comes to deciding what we do in worship, what the plan of salvation is, how the church ought to be organized, all of that has to be determined not by popular vote of uninspired men, but it has to be determined by saying, what did Jesus say about this through his apostles and through his own words in his earthly ministry? And therefore, now that we know what he said about it, are we willing to ex accept his authority and to do what he said do in exactly the way he said to do it? The commandments of the New Testament for Christians to sing praises to God do not mention a mechanical instrument. In fact, in Ephesians 5.19, we learn that the word psalms that is used to translate the word solo literally meant 
to sing exclusively. That's exactly how Walter Bauer translated it in his well-known Greek dictionary. When God gave that specific commandment to sing, that automatically excluded all other types of music. The, the reason we don't use instrumental music is because it's not authorized. Now people often say, well, it doesn't say not to, but that really has nothing to do with it. Suppose, for example, you get up in the morning, you feel bad. You go to the doctor, the doctor says you got a virus. So he writes a prescription that calls for sulfur. He takes it to the pharmacy, the pharmacist looks at it and says that's called for sulfur. But I've been adding a little penicillin to this along, and so he adds that to it. You learn about it, you go back and ask, why did you add that? He said, well, it didn't say not to. That had nothing to do with it. All he had the right to do, what did he prescribe? Now, the only way we can know what pleases God is what does his word say? And every verse in New Testament deal with music and worship or the kind of music God wants is vocal music. Thus, that's what's authorized and nothing else is. Like, for example, when God told Noah to make the an ark of gopher wood, nowhere do you read that he said, don't use hickory, don't use walnut. But when he said gopher wood, that excluded every other kind of wood. Indeed, the unique singing found in God's house is most assuredly a cappella, that is, without the accompaniment of mechanical instruments. But what about before the establishment of the Lord's church? Weren't mechanical instruments of music used in the Old Testament? Yes, they are. But the Old Testament reflected a very elementary scheme of things, a carnal system, according to, to Hebrews 9.10. The Old Testament contained the offerings of bloody sacrifices. The Old Testament had the burning of incense. The Old Testament had a physical tribal priesthood through whom the rank and file of the people approached God. But that carnal system was laid aside, as the writer of Hebrews argues in chapter 9 of that document. The Old Testament regime was superseded by a spiritual system. It behooves then the truth seeker, and this is important, of today not to go beyond what is written in the Word of God. That's very important. As God has specified the elements of the fruit of the vine and the bread to be utilized in the Lord's memorial supper, so He has specified, and this is important, singing as opposed to playing an instrument. I am sure that none of us would want to add rice or Coca-Cola to the Lord's Supper, even though we might like them, and even though God is not specifically condemned them. Well, then what about adding rice and Coca-Cola and mechanical instruments to the worship? Would this really be acceptable? Christians of the first century had instruments of music at their disposal, but they chose not to use them, and that's important, as a part of their worship. It was a extremely distinguishing characteristic of the Lord's church at that time. So friend, once again I ask you, does the church where you attend have this distinguishing characteristic? Does your church worship according to the Bible? The distinguishing marks of a cappella music and other unique forms of worship along with the unique foundation, organization, name, founder, and builder are all essential parts of what make up the New Testament house of God. These characteristics and these unique marks are but a few of the examples found in the New Testament which reveal the peculiar nature of the Lord's church, the Lord's house. Other marks would include its unique doctrine, which is the Bible, the Word of God. This work, the work of the church, includes a narrow scope involving evangelism, edification of its members, and benevolence, that is, helping those who are poor or in need. The house of God also has a unique membership who are dedicated to being disciples of Christ and who simply wear the name Christian Many of the religious names worn today were not in existence during the first century. Instead, baptized believers of the Bible wore the name of the one who gave his life on Calvary. A study of the New Testament will also reveal that each individual Christian is a part of the priesthood. According to the Bible, a clergy laity system should not exist. In the sight of God, every baptized believer is considered a priest and therefore able and expected to minister within the house and temple of God. 
And finally, the Lord's house has ministers such as deacons and preachers or evangelists who are required to meet certain qualifications as outlined in the book of 1 Timothy. They are simply servants in the body of Christ who along with all members of the church are prohibited from wearing religious titles such as father or reverend. So friend, in answering our second major question, we can clearly see that God's house does have many unique and distinguishable characteristics. And with each characteristic, we can see how the church of Jesus Christ should be organized, how it should worship, and what it should teach. But now, let's ask our third major question, and that is, can we establish this house today? In other words, can the house which Jesus built and established in the first century, the church of which we read about in the Bible, can it be established or built today in your community or neighborhood? Let's ask one who happens to be both a carpenter and a preacher. You know, churches are a lot like houses. They have a design and they have a designer. They have a foundation and a structure. And they have unique characteristics that are peculiar to the individual homeowner. Every house has its own set of blueprints. If I were to build this house or any other house, or at least try to, I would be lost without a set of blueprints. I could open up these blueprints and build this house just like the designer or the architect intended. But what is noteworthy, I can take these plans and build this house in North or South America, in Africa, Europe, or Asia. And as long as the materials were in existence that it took to build this house, I could build this house in any of these places today or 50 years from now simply by looking and following the blueprints. Now when it comes to building the Lord's house, I could do the same thing. I can take this Bible and use it as a pattern or a set of blueprints and build the Lord's house in North or South America, Africa, or anywhere else. If I use its instructions concerning its organization, its name, its worship, and teach what the New Testament says concerning entrance into the Lord's church, is it not the Lord's house? If I could take a denominational creed book, study it, and establish a denominational church by using its bylaws, why couldn't I simply take the gospel of Christ and establish a church of Christ? Indeed, Christ's church and the Lord's house are one and the same. And if we want to establish the Lord's house in any community, we had better use the blueprints found in the New Testament. It is certainly true the Bible should be used as a blueprint or a pattern for both establishing the church and for living the Christian life. Consider, for example, what the Apostle Paul said about the Word of God being a pattern or a blueprint. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul said about following the traditions as established by the apostles as revealed in the written word of God. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, according to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22, the divinely appointed apostles assisted Jesus in laying the foundation of the church we also learn in Matthew 16, verse 19, that these same apostles bound on earth, and according to the force of the Greek language, bound on earth what God had already bound in heaven. And they loosed on earth what God had already loosed in heaven. As the Lord's ambassadors, these apostles were establishing church precedents. Precedents which must be followed by Christians today. All disciples of Jesus must follow what the apostles taught and what was written down here by those apostles in the New Testament. This New Testament, which contains those traditions, those commandments, is a blueprint. It's a pattern. And if we want to maintain our fellowship in the body of Christ, then we must obey 
these traditions. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. So in answering our third major question of can we build the house of God today, we must answer unequivocally yes. And friend, not only can we build the house of God today, we must build it according to the divine specifications as revealed in God's holy word, as given by the apostles, as they were inspired of the Holy Spirit. Following apostolic authority, as revealed in the written word of the New Testament, is not an option. What was written here must be obeyed. It must be followed. And, according to an Old Testament principle found in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, we must not add to the Word of God. That same principle is found in the New Testament as well. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, friend, let me ask you something. Have you, or those with whom you worship, added something to the Lord's house, which was never intended nor authorized by God? Does the church where you attend possess the characteristics as revealed in the New Testament? If you were to make a comparison between the church of the New Testament and the church you now attend, would you find a church built on Jesus? Does the church you now belong to wear the name of Christ? Is Jesus the head of the church where you attend? And is that church organized with qualified elders and deacons? Does it worship in truth? And finally, does the church where you now attend teach that there is only one church to which baptized believers must be added? If not, then I plead with you to go and search today for a true church of Christ. Now so far, we have learned indeed that the Lord does have a house. And that house is also known as the church. It's also known as the kingdom of God. Now the Lord's house has a builder, and that builder is Jesus Christ. And we've noted that the Lord's house has many unique and identifiable characteristics. We have also learned that in establishing God's house today, we must follow the blueprint as revealed in the New Testament and that we must not deviate from that blueprint. Now friend, are you a member of God's house? If you are a member of God's house, have you been guilty of altering the divine pattern for God's house as revealed in the New Testament Word of God? You know the Lord has only one house. And so if that house exists within your community, why don't you go and search for it and become a member of it even today? If it doesn't exist within your community, why not begin today by taking this Bible as a blueprint and establish a house as designed by Jesus, establish the church of Jesus. Remember, in John 4 and verse 24, Jesus said that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We've also learned that in John 17, 17, that the word of God is truth. And so therefore we must worship God according to truth, according to the word of God. Are you worshiping God in truth? Are you a part of a church that is established upon truth? Remember Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the truth shall set you free. God's word.